While many factors do feel beyond our control right now, our next speaker, Emiliana simon is Thomas will share some evidence-based strategies you can use to improve happiness and well-being. Emiliana is the Science Director of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, and she's co-instructor of its popular Science of Happiness online course. Emiliana? Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be included in this webinar. Don, I am moved and stunned and inspired by your presentation. Thank you for giving us such a insightful and empirical review of the contextual and policy level issues that we're grappling with. And I say that because I want to um, acknowledge the fact that what I'm going to talk about uh, really has little bearing on that in terms of a collective uh, solution to the problems that we're all grappling with, but more is about how individuals can shift habits or patterns of behavior or priorities in ways that can serve their own happiness and also contribute to the happiness of the people that they interact with and their communities. And of course, the hope is that through this personal shift and work and prioritization, people uh, might also realize the importance of these bigger policy level and collective um, changes that are also absolutely necessary to um, addressing the challenges that we're facing. So just to get us all on the same page of what I mean and what most scientists who study happiness mean when they say the word happiness, it's an overarching characteristic uh, of, of one's life, how you typically tend to feel and think about yourself and the context that you live in. Um, it's also called subjective well-being. Um, I like to share Sonia Lubomirsky's definition. Uh, Sonia is one of the pioneers in happiness research, wrote a book called The How of Happiness, if you are really interested in more detail. She defines it as the experience of joy, contentment, or positive well-being combined with a sense that one's life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. Um, this gets me to also share what happiness is not. Um, research does not support the idea that happiness is somehow a genetic affordance. It's not something that you either end up with because of your family lineage or end up without. Uh, in fact, there is lots of evidence that uh, individual happiness levels can change over the course of life as a result of um, activities, exercises, priorities, and um, uh, we'll talk about these uh, as I continue with this presentation. Uh, it's also a mistake to equate happiness with, in, with specific moments of positive emotional experience. Um, we often make that mistake. Our media and, and advertising powers that be sort of um, invite us uh, to believe that happiness is about material possessions or uh, accomplishments about um, achieving the, uh, the list of goals that we may have made for ourselves. In fact, it's uh, perfectly possible to be um, uh, an unhappy person uh, with a, a, an accompanying great degree of success and privilege in the world. Um, of course, it's a lot easier to not worry about, um, about life circumstances if you do have your basic needs met. Um, but again, the point here is that if you think that happiness means trying to string together a constant sequence of, of joyful emotional experiences, you actually end up being less happy than a person who thinks of happiness in the way that I shared earlier as this broad overarching aspect of life that includes the grief, the anger, the um, fear that uh, are important when we uh, experience setbacks or difficulties, which often actually end up being quite meaningful. And as you remember or may recall, happiness uh, sort of rests on this sense that your life is meaningful. Um, so uh, there are lots of different factors that contribute to happiness. This is a recent review by Andrew Steptoe. And uh, rather than go through them one by one, what I'd like to really argue here is that every single one of them has a veneer of social connection uh, uh, upon them. So uh, we know, for instance, from cutting-edge gen genetic studies that 
your social experiences early in life and throughout life actually impose uh, an influence on an epigenetic influence on how your genes express themselves. So if you are a lonely person, if you report being lonely, your the genes of in your that control your immune response express in a way that actually puts you at greater risk for hyperinflammatory disorders. So these are some of the sort of social issues that that Don was pointing to. Um, I could go around this whole circle and tell a similar story about how important our social interactions are to all of these factors and how they contribute to the potential for each of them to actually drive up or down our happiness levels. I'll share a couple more key findings, uh, and this one's pretty similar to one that Don shared, which is to say that when we look overall at people's sense of social um, trust, um, sense, uh, connection, common humanity, willingness to um, take risks knowing that they'll be supported, also holding in mind that others rely on them in meaningful ways for support. What I've just summarized is what would be considered uh, being someone who is uh, securely attached. It means you really feel confident in your sense of belonging. Roy Bauermeister wrote about how important and intrinsic the need to belong is to humans. So people who have that, who have that as opposed to feeling anxious or always uh, wanting to avoid or um, suppress their emotional uh, opportunities, they are at much lower risk, so substantially lower risk of a number of psychiatric disorders in addition to uh, health challenges. So this is a kind of early life social experience influence on lifelong health and well-being. Um, maybe some of you have heard about or read about the um, Harvard study of adult development, which for 80 years has been following a cohort of people to try to figure out like what matters, what's most important to our health and well-being. And as the quote suggests, um, the key to healthy aging ultimately turns out to be relationships. And then this is not a typo, relationships, relationships. Um, these researchers just kept finding again and again when they looked at the data that individuals who leaned in to their relationships with family, friends, and community uh, were protected against chronic disease, mental illness, even memory decline, and all of these are associated with your willingness to claim that you are someone who is happy in life. So what's going on right now and what's making it hard for us to connect socially in the face of COVID-19? Uh, first off uh, is the uncertainty, the ambiguity. Being in a state where we don't know what's going on makes us more vigilant, makes us feel less trusting. We, our sense of agency, of, of capacity to do anything is challenged. And all of this sort of is at odds with our sense of affiliation, of generosity, or being outgoing. Secondly, we are facing uh, really uh, specific mandates to stay physically separate from people, to shelter in our homes. This is preventing us from having the typical sort of contact with our communities, rubbing elbows. This typical contact is always giving us implicit information about how trustworthy other people are and how much we belong. And so being denied that, we are left in a position of feeling more isolated, of feeling more separate. Um, video conference modalities, thank you for joining us today as we're desperately trying to use this modality to still maintain connections. Regardless, it is not the same as face-to-face -face interaction. We can't touch one another. We don't have the same synchrony of biological signals that happens, according to the work of Ruth Feldman, when we are in close proximity to one another. We are, um, it's just not as fulfilling because we don't have the spontaneous synchrony that we have in in-person conversations. And then finally, this whole experience of co-quarantining is challenging for our relationships um, suddenly being faced with homeschooling for those of us who are parents, um, being sensitive to the fact that some people are considered essential, some may not feel like they're so essential, some of us have access to resources, some of us don't. Um, all of this is just making it more difficult for us to have those meaningful, connected moments of social contact. Um, so now I'm going to get into the practical tools, some of the practical strategies we can employ to try to correct for these challenges that we have to bring more social connection and meaningful interaction into our day-to-day -day lives. Number one, we just have to 
deliberately prioritize it. Um, it's very easy to go through our days just scheduling a series of obligations and tasks that don't involve those meaningful connections because they're not happening spontaneously through our sports events, through our team, through our socializing, through our community events, through our extracurricular activities. We need to prioritize them. We need to make phone calls, arrange uh, informal video uh, and dates with our friends and family, and even other avenues where we might be able to connect with people with common interests or, um, or uh, um, occupational uh, focus. Um, one of the things that we can do to make these interactions more rich and interpersonally fulfilling is ask people about what's going well, and that's what's meant by cap capitalizing on positive events. And while we're doing this, uh, utilize what we call active listening. And that means instead of waiting for the pause where you can interject or planning how you're going to reply to what someone's saying, really just listening to the words that they are sharing with you and understanding them in an empathic and focused way. Empathy is one of these affordances that we are born with. and. It gets stronger if we use it, and it becomes atrophied if we don't. And active listening is a way of strengthening our empathy, of just noticing and getting better at taking other people's perspectives. Uh, expressing gratitude is a way to strengthen our sense of connection. It's called the find, remind, and bind emotion because it helps us connect with others who are potential collaborators, uh, people we might coordinate our efforts with to accomplish bigger goals. I have an asterisk because I want to give you some details about how exactly to express it in a way that's most powerful. Um, I also wanted to uh, highlight small talk. When you find yourself waiting in line even at a six feet distance uh, and there's a stranger in front of you and behind you, it's important, again, to correct for this socially distanced time by having a few fun, friendly, and informal questions in your pocket to share with someone. Um, uh, you could ask them if they've, if they've listened to a podcast that they uh, think is fascinating or what was the best book that they've read or any number of ways to just highlight that sense of common humanity can really bring back into your awareness and your habit of thinking that sense of connection. Uh, so to get really good at gratitude, be specific and targeted. It involves describing what a person did that you're thanking them for, what did they do that actually resulted in a positive outcome for you, acknowledge their effort, you know, what did they forego, what, did, what you know, energy did they put into doing this for you, uh, and then finally explain how they benefited you. When we uh, share gratitude with this specificity, and this is work of Sarah Algo, we actually cause a greater release of oxytocin which is a neuropeptide that makes us feel connected and trusting and affiliative. Okay, one more set of uh, ideas that you can bring into your day-to-day -day life uh, during COVID-19. Random acts of kindness. It's not just a bumper sticker in Berkeley, California. It is a real strategy for uh, uplifting your own happiness, for making somebody else feel more happy in a given day, and uh, even more interestingly, people who witness random acts of kindness between others uh, feel morally elevated and uplifted and are more likely to turn and be kind in their own life circumstances. So it might feel a little bit different because COVID-19 has the um, has the challenges uh, of interacting with people that we're all familiar with. But uh, if you want to get inspired, uh, there are many groups that are trying to highlight what you can do. Check out hashtag COVID kindness, for example. There are ways that we can still go out and be involved in the world uh, in ways that are helpful to others. Um, our, our skills in extending compassion and consoling each other are really important to bring to the forefront in this time. Um, for some of us, meditation practices, contemplative practices, maybe even centering prayer practices that really get us to touch base with that innate urge to care and concern ourselves with the welfare of others. We call this pro-sociality. This is a really important part of maintaining our sense of meaningful connection with others during COVID-19. And then finally, for those of us who are co-quarantining with other people or even trying to maintain relationships through virtual channels, 
Working on our skills of managing conflict is a really promising strategy. This might mean that we let go of anger when we feel frustrated towards a person. Can we think of that person as a human who simply made a bad decision in that moment, as we might have in our own lives at different times, and through that feel a sense of compassion for them having made that mistake and figure out where we can begin at cultivating some kind of shared understanding Apologizing, holding ourselves accountable, um, we're notoriously bad at that in the U.S. as very individualistic, self-righteous personas. Um, and then forgiveness, you know, deciding that we're not going to hold on to and maintain a perpetual angst and, and fear around a past um, offense is a really valuable way to uplift our own happiness uh, and also um, contribute to the welfare of our community when uh, we have ongoing um, conflict or um, disagreement. Um, I'll close with a slide that is a study that looked at the effects of engaging in the kinds of practices that I just shared with you, um, which I would call socially engaged because they involve kind of connecting with others, interacting with others in benevolent and pro-social ways. Uh, the effect of them on life satisfaction over the course of a year compared to other strategies for self-improvement, which we'll call non-social. So this could include like setting goals or um, stress management and really uh, compare the impact of, of these two different kinds of practices. And this team showed that these socially engaged strategies just had more. They had more power to change life satisfaction than the non-social strategies when it comes to happiness. So overall, what we know from the science of happiness is that when we, when we learn about what really matters to happiness and how to think about happiness, when we explore these research-backed practices and activities and exercises that help us form and strengthen social connections, and we exercise them. We don't just learn about them and then just think, okay, now they're going to work. We exercise them, much like we would exercise our muscles in order to get stronger in a fitness routine. We actually can improve our happiness as well as contribute to the happiness of the people around us. And um, this is just really important in the time of COVID-19. Thank you so much. Um, again, I hope that what I've said is useful and can contribute to your well-being moving forward.